Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. I know we're a little small group, but um, Deborah's story is interesting and fascinating. I'm glad you could join us. My name is Mary Jean Harrison. I'm the assistant director. This program is part two of our Local Voices series, which was uh, funded by the Common Heritage Grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Okay, um, Deborah is our featured speaker. She retired after 38 years of working for the federal government and discovered a true love of genealogy. Deborah's interest in her family began with her great uncle Joe. Uncle Joe, who was fondly remembered, would share family stories at his great nieces and nephews sat on the floor at his feet, listening intently. I think everybody has an uncle like that. <laughs> uncle Joe never had children of his own, but he was the favorite. Deborah was captivated by how the family survived in a trying and prejudiced era. As a result, her curiosity and thirst for more information grew. All right, in addition to personal research, Deborah provides research for others. She writes and documents her findings. So she's a professional uh, genealogist. Okay, that's pretty cool. She has volunteered for the um, Conyers Latter-day Saints Family History Library, as well as the Institute for Genealogy and History Research. She is currently active in the Rockdale uh, Newton Genealogical Society. You'll see conference in front of you. <clears throat> she concentrates on U.S. railroad systems, especially the Pennsylvania Railroad era, and has indexed several cemeteries, and has attended numerous educational and training seminars. Okay. In addition to her time spent researching, she has and continues to create beautiful glass and clay art. So if you please can give her a warm welcome. And she, unlike me, doesn't need the microphone. I don't think I need it. Can you hear me? Good, good. Um, I would like to share with you my love for genealogy. I've been doing it since 1986. And then once I retired, I just was able to spend much more, much more time with it. And um, Uncle Joe, I'll just tell you, was my mom's paternal uncle. But what I want to talk to you today is about my mother's maternal side. And once I started doing the research on them, uh, I had nothing to go on other than my grandmother. I knew her, but she didn't know her mother. She had, her mother died when she was very young. But I always remember my mother talking about that side of the family. Not that she knew about it, but it was talk, storytelling. So with that, I'm going to start. I'd like to let you know that between March the 4th, 9, uh, 1829 and March 1837, Andrew Jackson was our president at that time. He instituted a law called the Indian Removal Act of 1830. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that in your school. And that was his biggest legacy. And that legacy later impacted in what we call, or created what we call the, tear, the Trail of Tears. And it was the largest uh, movement against an average Aboriginal <laughs> here in the United States. It was to move Native Americans uh, west across the Mississippi to Oklahoma. And it lasted 11 years. And the goal was to make sure that every last Native American was removed. The reason for that, some of it was because of gold, some of it was for land lobbies, but there was a whole host of reasons why. There were five tribes uh, uh, or Aboriginal people that was moved, and they were the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, Choctaw, the Muskegon, uh, Muskegon uh, Creek, and the Samoans. And once the movement started, it was some 16,552 people that made this trip. A lot of them didn't make it because of the unbearable conditions. They perished because of gunshot, exposure to the elements, starvation, malnutrition, 
common related diseases such as pneumonia and smallpox. Of these five tribes, the Creek had black slaves to help perform their labor and their movement, so theirs was not as painful. But nevertheless, it was painful. But I want to share with you a story about one of the survivors. I would like to introduce myself. I am Elvira. My nickname is Fiery, and I was born in 1814. I am a member of the Cherokee Nation in what is now North Carolina. The year is 1831, and on this day, the air is cool and crisp. I am playing with my playmates, running, jumping, and, and playing outdoors. We never noticed the six men in uniforms galloping and riding on horseback, but I did notice that they did not stay long. After they left, I was remembering my mother calling for me deliriously. My mother wanted to know where was my brother, as she commanded me to help her gather household belongings. And I must have had a puzzled look on my face that I did not understand what was, the, what was going on, what was the purpose. The white men didn't allow us enough time to gather our belongings. And what little we did gather was not enough for our impending journey. As mother and I gathered our meager belongings, my father and brother did appear. My mother rushed over to my father's side and talked to him. I couldn't understand or hear really or make out what they were saying, but I had never seen my mother with such despair and my father so angry. I didn't recall how long it took us to gather our things, but it wasn't enough time. The white men were watching. We packed and packed, and finally had no more time to pack. The white man told us to leave now, just leave now. My father lifted me aboard our brown and white spotted pony, just behind my older brother. Anasi, the Cherokee word for, me, for paternal grandmother, refused to move. But in the, in the end, with the constant encouraging and coaxing of my mother, she consented. Once behind our brother, he gave our pony a gentle nudge, and we followed our parents. Anasi rode on the trailers with the horse, with her arms crossed and tight lipped, and, and she was being pulled behind my mother's horse and my mother's pony. For three weeks we rode. I don't remember much at all about the, the journey itself. I do remember talking to and asking my brother. Why did we have to leave so quickly? He responded by telling me the white man does not want us to live among them. I really didn't understand what he meant. I was none of this, none of this was making sense. After all, I was only 15 years old. The entire camp rode, days passed, nights passed, and some days it seemed like the days would never end. The nights were cold and pitch dark and I stayed close to my mother. And at night, I slept between my mother and my father for safety. I was always afraid at night. I could hear the owls in the trees, the cows howling, and the wind stirring. I remembered at night, I could never get warm enough. Oh, how I hated this trip, and why was I moving? When I would hear my father talk to the other gentlemen in the camp, I could hear and still detect the hostility and rage in his voice. Hours passed, days passed, weeks passed, and they turned into months. There were sunny days, there were misty, rainy days, and then there was just snow, lots of it. At the beginning of the 12th moon, we made camp in a place called Tennessee, in the county of Franklin. During the journey, I no longer played idly with the others as I used to. I became a beautiful young woman. I stood as tall as my mother with long brown hair, my cheekbones so high they reached the sky, and deep set brown that would disappear when I could manage a smile. During the day, I joined my mother and the other women in the camp, performing various chores, 
such as sewing to make clothes to keep our people warm. We cook deer and wild turkey the men hunted. As we moved, squirrel and rabbit meat and other meat offerings were hunted. As time passed, the twinkle in my mother's eyes no longer shone. In my father's easygoing, fun-loving personality disappeared. My life had changed forever. Many moons had passed, and now I am the mother of a baby boy. I call him Andy. And here he is. One day in the white man's year of 1832, we camped near a big plantation owned by a white family named the Grays. They lived in a big house with large pillars, a porch that seemed to extend forever, and all kinds of beautiful horses and fields filled the, filled, filled the fields, and it was white stuff. They called it cotton. The cotton dotted the fields as far as the naked eye could see. I could see brown people, many of them. They looked the same as some of my people once owned. The brown people carried huge bags on their backs. They filled the bags with this white cotton from sun up to sundown. I often asked myself, what will become of this cotton? As time passes, I could find out why. This cotton is so valuable. It makes the graves who live in the house so rich. Our camp is close to the Elk River, and it divides the white man's counties of Franklin and Coffee. The graves live near the Elk, and they own a lot of black people. Some days, the women in our camp would wash clothes in the Elk River. Sometimes our children play and frolic together. The children laugh running about the Elk River banks. They, ran, they, they run and they play for hours and hours. The women's eyes are always on the children, always. One day I was busy and the day was hot. I, I allowed my auntie to play with the other children near the camp. As I turned to check on him, he was not in sight. I don't see him. I don't see him at all. Andy, I called. No answer. I called again. Andy, no answer. My Andy is gone. I can't find my Andy anywhere. When I can't find my Andy, I scream, Andy, Andy, Andrew. I began to run frantically, looking for him. I can't see him because of the tears that blinded my eyes. My heart is pounding in my chest so hard, I thought it was going to pound out. As I run, I trip and fall, and in my head, I ask, where was my auntie? In my grave, you can stare at a dark, tall, brown man with broad shoulders. He was as tall as the birch trees that grow, and in his hand was my auntie's. They approached me. He never so gently, he, he ever so gently leads auntie to me. Is this your Andy? I look between my tears and whisper, yes. I grab and hug him, Andy, so tight. Andy replies to me, I'm concerned. Unity, the Cherokee word for mother. Cheerfully, he says to me, I want you to meet my friend Solomon. Solomon Hunt, this is my Unity. And that is how I met Solomon. In the coming days and months, I spent a lot of time with this Solomon, or they call him Solomon. Soon, Andy and I left my mother in my father's camp. And shortly after I made the Cherokee Nation along the Elk River, with my friend, family and friends, left Tennessee. Before my family left, Saul and I made our home close to the Elk River. That was the last time I saw my family. In time, our union produced five beautiful babies, and Andrew, Andrew was a big brother. Our children ranged in various hues of dark chocolate to creamy light brown. Some were tall, some were short, some had curly hair, some had straight, some had red hair, some had black. But in the end, they were our children and we adored them. From 1833 to 1860, we had John, 
we had Molly, we had Aaron, we had Kennedy, and we had Sarah. She was born in 1834 in Winchester, Tennessee. Molly was the third child of Saul and Bonnie. I speak the white man's English and the Cherokee's language. Because of my mother's, mother's social status, I was not born a slave. Even though my father was before being emancipated, I married John. McGee, who was a slave. He is nine years my senior, and our union produced nine children. Between the, eight, between the years of 1864 and 1884, we had William, we had Fanny, we had Sarah, we had John, we had Addie, we had Katie, Betty, Mary, and Lily. Molly died of pneumonia on December the 18th. 1930 at age 96 in Winchester, Tennessee, where she lived with her daughter, Mary, until her death. And sadly, Molly outlived three of her nine children. I am Johnny McKee, and I am the granddaughter of Byron and Solomon Hunt. I was named after my father. Because you see, he wanted a boy. And so I was named John. But if you look at me, I don't look like a boy. And I was born on February the 18th, 1871, in Winchester, Tennessee. On December the 27th, 1895, I married George Dennison in, in Winchester. And our union produced two daughters, Asaline, born. March the 29th in 1892, and Jenny in, <coughs> in 1901. <coughs> Johnny was, as a side note, Johnny was only 33 years old when she died of septic poison. Johnny died on September the 12th, 1906, in Nashville, Tennessee, while seeking medical attention from this poison. When she died, she orphaned two daughters. Her body was returned to Winchester for burial, where she is buried now and rests in the uh, Franklin County Cemetery for the colored people. But I am Azaline Denson, and I am the great granddaughter of Bobby and Saul. I was born March the 29th, 1892, in the state of Alabama, which borders Franklin County, Tennessee. On September the 17th, I married a man named William Mansley Murray. We got married in Winchester. We, we never called him William. He was always known as Mans. He was called by his middle name for eons. But we had one daughter, and she was married Edna McMurray. I'd like to tell you that, that as we was described as tall, thin, and brown complexion. She was only 22, 22 years old when she died of tuberculosis on, on June the 9th, 1914, in Winchester. She is buried near her mother, Johnny, and her husband, Mance, never married again. I am Mary Edna McMurray. I am named after my maternal grandmother and aunt. I am the second great granddaughter of Bobby and Saul. I was born on, on June the 29th, 1911, in Winchester, Tennessee. I did not know at the time, but my great aunt birthed me. She was my midwife. Since my mother died when I was 13 years old, I was raised by my father and my paternal grandparents, George and Mary Ann McMurray. My grandfather, George, was born a slave, but after being emancipated, he came to become a landowner. 
only land allowed funds available for me to be educated at an all-girls school and is located in Nashville, Tennessee. My father and I moved to Nashville where, I, where my dad worked as a janitor to help assist with the expenses, of our living expenses, and to oversee my education. In 1926, I was only 15 years old, and sadly, my dad became ill and died. I was orphaned. Again, I returned to Winchester to live with my paternal grandparents. One of my father's older sisters, Mary Edna, Mary Edna Mae Murray Wiseman, also assisted in rearing me. In 1930, at the age of 18, she sent me to live with my other aunt, my father's sister, Luella. My aunt Luella arranged a marriage, marriage for me by a stable widow, James Mangum. Unfortunately, this marriage did not last. However, it did produce four children that survived to adulthood. Betty, James Jr., Matt, and Florence. After leaving Winchester, Mary Edna never returned to her hometown. And in February 1957, Mary Edna was diagnosed with breast cancer. Her, de her disease were, was aggressive and rapid, very rapid. She died six months later on January the 8th, 1958, and she was only 47 years old. I am Betty Jean, and I am the third great granddaughter of Byron and Saul. I was named after my father's older sister, Betty. I was born in, and raised in the great state of Ohio. After high school, I married James Harney, and we had two daughters, Deborah and Jocelyn. And as a footnote, like her parents' marriage, it ended in divorce. And she relocated, she married and relocated out of the area. She and her siblings obtained college degrees, which was uncommon for the time. Sadly, she died on November 21st, 2013, of pancreatic cancer, one week before Thanksgiving. And I am Deborah Hunt, and I am the fourth great granddaughter of James, of, of, Sol, of, of, of Bobby and Solomon Hunt. And this is my lineage, and this is who I am. And with 15% of Native American heritage, my story is that I am really rooted in the original American heritage and fabric. My ancestors toiled to make this America great, and it's a great place to be, and I'm proud of who I am. I wanted to take a few minutes to tell you I don't have my direct ancestor, which would have been Molly of, of, of uh, Ivera, Ivera and Solomon's children. But these were some of her children. And these children were born in the early 1800s, and they lasted. Uh, um, Sally was the youngest, and she died in 1926 19, 19, of breast cancer. In doing my research, I've learned a lot of things about research. Um, not just this arm, but several arms. All the book, this book right here is my Hunt family. And if I, it is nothing but data, something that will bore you to death. And so therefore, I tried to make it interesting by telling you who I was. I would like to share with you there is uh, more to a person than their, their birth, their death, their marriage, and their death. There's a whole bunch of stuff in between. Take the time to find it. I found a lot of things about my relatives with tax records, uh, legal records, uh, arrest records, marriage, and a whole host of things, which I found very interesting. Another good tip would be find out what's going on during that particular time, the history. As you heard me say that Elvira was Native American, and she was uh, moving out of the area. She was to be. She was to move to Oklahoma, 
but she got stopped. A lot of our Native American people did not go west. They lived among uh, all of us. The same things that were going on then, now went on then. When I was searching for the hunts, I was looking for Solomon, and I just got sidetracked with Elvira. And I couldn't understand why Elvira would marry Solomon. But what I found out that was that Solomon's father was born in 1790, and he was a free man of color. Being that free man of color, he had a little bit more uh, freedom, if you will, carrying his fingers. Um, most people who were free blacks lived in Virginia. They originated from that area. He, too, was from Virginia. Uh, another thing that I found interesting was the name Adams. Johnny, if you will recall, most people thought was a man, but she wasn't. She was a woman. She was named after her father because her father was a boy. He eventually got a boy, but he had had so many girls until, um, uh, and, and she, once she was named Johnny, then he started having his boys. Another thing that I found was going to be was the family diseases. We're still, in my family, experiencing the same diseases that these ancestors had early in the 1800s. And with that, I just say to you, review, review, review. Because every time I go back and look at my binder, I find something else. And Uncle Joe and my grandfather were born in the 1800s. 
and they weren't that far removed from slavery. And so I had that advantage. Where on the other side, the Hunts, I didn't meet them until I started researching. My mother didn't know them uh, because her mother were, was separated from the maternal side. When you said you did your research, like, where did you go exactly? I mean, were you going to old newspapers, records, the court records? Um, I found out that three-fourths of my family was from Tennessee. I found out what, um, what counties they were. And once I found out that they were in Franklin County, Tennessee, which bordered um, Georgia, and the other one was job. I got in my car and I drove. And I went to, uh, in Franklin County, we have an archive. And I went in there and I was, uh, it was just like a little house. And they pulled out boxes and stuff and it was dusty. And that particular day that I went there, that one time, because I've been there several times, um, I think everybody, the whole staff, was helping me look for my stuff uh, or my family. And I found that my grandfather had uh, was arrested for drinking and pumping, playing dice and uh, uh, bastard uh, 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 um, charges. Uh, another person was a relative of bastard charges. And so I was able to obtain all that. I went and I got tax records. Uh, probate, wills, uh, all in the courthouse area. And I did that for both Franklin County as well as Giles County. And my husband's always, uh, and there, there he sits, my biggest fan, uh, has always, it was laughing because my parents met in Ohio, but they were both from there. My dad was born in Tennessee, but my mom's family was from Tennessee. And they didn't know each other, and just one county separated them. It was just meant to be. So I, I do get in the car, and I do go, and, 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 and what I, I um, when I couldn't travel, I wrote letters. And that was helpful, because I requested the information in writing, and I always gave them, them a donation. And what is, what is your major purpose for wanting to really find out? Oh, the right. of, yeah. It was just a curious, uh, uh, just a curiosity. Um, I, just, I just wanted to understand and know who, where, why, when, you know. And even on this family, even though I'm going back to 1790, I'm not finished. I will probably go to another arm. Uh, another family of mine and come back. 